Hello, and welcome back to the Cup Experience Show, covering all the details of the 36th America's Cup. Well, after a short, albeit unplanned delay, we are back. This is show number nine, day number three of the Prada Cup Challenger Selection Series to determine what team will move on to face Emirates Team New Zealand in the finals of the 36th America's Cup match next month. Hi, I'm Tucker Thompson, broadcasting here in the United States. I'm joined by my friend Jack Griffin of CupExperience.com, up late at night in Switzerland. And Jack, as you know, we've had a bit of time off due to a COVID scare in Auckland, New Zealand. The question is, are we going to get back to racing as normal per the schedule? Well, the racing starts uh, on Saturday in New Zealand time, and we will be done by Wednesday the 24th. That is part of the rules that were made for the event months ago. America's Cup event tried to say that they wanted to have a delay so they could have more fans. They wanted to change the rules, which seems a little strange to me. Be kind of like saying, you know, you're on, uh, you're on port, I'm on starboard. I should duck you because the fans will like it better. I just don't get that. We'll be done on the 24th. And if, the, all, if no one has won seven races by then, whoever's ahead is the winner. That's what the rules say. That's what's going to happen. Okay, well, the show must go on, as they say. And before our show goes on, we want to thank the sponsors who make it possible. It's the Sponsor 60, 60 seconds to give credit to the sponsors who support us, beginning with Mount Gay Rum, the official sailor's rum. Find Mount Gay at drizzly.com or order your own cocktail set. They're pre-made uh, with all the ingredients at Cocktail Courier. There's a link below. And you can send us your America's Cup watch party photos with you guys and Mount Gay Rum. We'll put you guys in the shows. We want to hear from you. Thank you to Sea Deck Adhesive Foam Decking, which will literally transform the deck of your boat. It did for mine, and it did, of course, for American Magic as well, among others. Thanks to Axa Nobel and their all-grip fast finishes. The sport's fastest yachts are finished with the all-grip next-generation top coat HDT. And Raba and Birking Silver, they have an American Magic collection, which is now a collector's edition. Pick up your cocktail tumblers, bottle coasters, serving trays, etc. They're amazing quality. And you can also customize them and put whatever you want, your boat name, uh, another logo, whatever you want on Raba and Birking Silver. It's pretty cool. Jack has more information or order AmericanMagic.CupExperience.com. And finally, Polini Coffee, the official coffee supplier of New York Yacht Club American Magic, with its Polini Top 100% Arabica Espresso. Polini Coffee, keeping sailors energized, and you can find it online at Amazon.com. Well, that brings us into the racing. And as we mentioned at the top of the show, we lost almost a week of potential race days due to the COVID-19 scare in Auckland. Fortunately, the threat level has dropped now to level two, so racing can commence within the original uh, Product Cup scheduled dates. As Jack said, it's the first to win seven. And right now, Lunarosa Prada Pirelli from Italy has won four races. Here's a look at last weekend's day number two of the Product Cup Finals. Day two of the Prada Cup final. The forecast was for more breeze and shifty too. Conditions that Ineos Team UK had previously excelled in. But confidence was high in the Italian camp. They were 2 0 ahead and their supporters fully behind them. Luna Rossa, Prada Pirelli were looking tougher by the day. In the pre start, the pair looked set to engage. Skipper Ben Ainsley certainly wanted to but got greedy trying to get the Italians under control and lost the advantage to Luna Rossa, who then had the upper hand in the early stages of the race. By the first gate, the Italians had kept the British under control, but the margin was small, just nine seconds. And while the British did all they could to pile on the pressure, the racing was close, the boat handling impressive, but there was never a lead change. The Italians stayed cool, calm and collected winning by 13 seconds. We, we can see how the English are uh, not easy to beat. Even with a bad start that they had, they were very close and uh, they wouldn't give up. Uh, so it's, it's impressive how, how they're holding uh, and uh, we have to keep uh, thinking about the next race. Yeah, we made a mess at the start. Uh, we just got a bit greedy going for the hook. Thought it was on for a split second. and. Um, you know, these match race starts, it go from here to zero pretty quick. Okay. In the second race of the day, Ineos continued to push hard, but tripped up. 
it nearly cost them dearly. Once again, Luna Rossa had the upper hand from the start and controlled Ineos all the way up the first leg. The distance, just 12 seconds at the first gate. In the face of intense pressure, Luna Rossa were continuing to excel, picking the best side of the course while controlling their opponents. Ineos were trying all they could, but couldn't make any impression on the Italians, who crossed the line 41 seconds ahead to take their fourth win in a row. Another dominant performance. Pretty. It's really good. Not too many high fives, boys. Nice and cool, boys. Today's racing was all about getting off the line in front, which we did a great job of. Uh, the boys and the handles did a outstanding job, you know, just tack for tack, and uh, we were just gaining every time. So very, very, uh, very happy with the lads on the handles today. Oh, yeah, tough day. We're not happy with it. Uh, you know, we can sell a hell of a lot better than that, and we need to. And, uh, yeah, we just gave two races to those guys. Uh, you know, bad, you know, off the start line. And uh, to their credit, they sell really well and didn't give us a, really a chance to get back into it. Uh, but at, at this level, you can't afford to make any mistakes and we, we made too many. So we've got to go away and regroup and really get our act together for Wednesday and come out swinging. Although they were now 4-0 up, the Italian team knew it was still too early for celebrations. And there's a look at the scores as they stand so far. You can see four wins and the first to get to seven wins in this regatta. And you heard it in the video. Lunarosa, happy, very confident with how they're sailing, but keeping it under control. And Ineos Team UK, Ben Ainsley, clearly not happy with, uh, with their performance. And, and he took, you know, took responsibility for these starts. You cannot have starts that are that bad against a... Uh, pre-start helmsman like Jimmy Spithill, and to be fair, Keko Bruni as well. Uh, and Ben Ainsley admits that, you know, Jack, he's not winning these races because he's not winning these starts. Yeah, you know, I'd love to see what happens if they, if Indios can get ahead. They have not been ahead of Luna Rosa at any point in any of the four races. Luna Rosa's boat the two boats are, are very comparable in performance. It, uh, Luna Rosa is tacking better. They come out of the tacks faster, so they're able to gain if there's a tacking duel, and they've been controlling them. But the boats are so close in speed that if, if Ineos can get off the line ahead, we have a completely different ball game to see. Let's see what happens today. That's a fair point. You know, another thing to note is if you watch Ben Ainsley in these pre-starts, he is making high-risk, aggressive moves that, well, really he doesn't need to do. And it's the sign of someone who's not confident perhaps in their boat or how their team is going to be able to perform uh, under the given conditions. You know, we saw this with Jimmy Spithill in Bermuda, um, Oracle Team USA up against Emirates Team New Zealand. And, the, you know, the Americans knew that they were a tick behind. And uh, Jimmy went for aggressive starts. Jack, it didn't work. Uh, Dean Barker, we just saw that in uh, the earlier rounds of this regatta, started uh, making moves in the starts that didn't pay off. And, and now Ben Ainsley's doing the same thing. So if, if there's a playbook, just simply look at history. It doesn't pay off to start aggressively, does it, Jack? No, you know, just get an even start or get to a position where you can have a chance of controlling the other guys. I think that, sure, in the light air, Luna Rosa is clearly superior to the Ineos boat. But if in medium air, just stay calm, work it, try to get a bitter, try to get a chance, give yourself a chance to get in control. That's what they've got to do. Well, on top of that, they're not only making moves that are too aggressive, but they're having issues with their foils. Jack, we're seeing sky jumps in the starts. We certainly saw in that race four last weekend. And if you're going to come flying up in the air and slamming down, uh, that's definitely not going to win you the start. Um, here's a look at uh, the issues that Ineos Team UK is having in the pre-starts with these sky jumps. So we're going to begin with uh, in the Prada Cup round robins. This is race three. Ineos Team UK to windward there. Big sky jump. Note that the breeze is on, and they would have had an even start. They lost about four boat lengths as they try to get back up to speed. Here comes the gun. Jimmy Spithill just puts the bow down. Lunarosa Prada Pirelli crosses the line first and wins that race. Here in the finals, race four, last weekend, same issue, Jack. 
They go for a luff to try and close gauge with the Italians. Huge sky jump. Bam! Boat comes pounding down. Look, Ainsley almost gets thrown overboard. And there's the result. They start behind, stay behind. And uh, Ineos Team UK wins, uh, wins the start there. Um, so, Jack, what do you think is happening in these sky jumps that, that causes the boat to do this? Now we've seen all the boats are capable of this, but it's happening to Ineos at exactly the wrong time. Yeah, it certainly is. And yes, it could happen to anybody. We've seen it happen to Team New Zealand. Look, sailing one of these things is like um, riding a, a tricycle backwards with one of the small wheels up in the air. The, 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 the axis around which it heals is from the rudder to the foil that's in the water. And this, I mean, it, it's like playing three-dimensional chess. There's so many things that can go wrong. Um, problem trimming the mainsail. You'll heel too much either to windward or to leeward. That will change the angle of attack on the main foil. Nose plow or sky jump. Um, have some problem go with the flight control. Same thing. Have the rudder rate control be wrong. I mean, it, it's just these boats are so, so, so difficult to sail that it's easy to make a mistake like this. And Luna Rosa, to their credit, haven't made any of these mistakes. Let's see what happens the next couple of days. It could happen to anybody, but so far it's been happening to Ineos Team UK. Yeah, I'm sure the British fans are not happy about that. One thing that you mentioned, Jack, is there's an axis of rotation between the forward lured foil and the, um, and the rudder foil. And this is an analogy you just made, a tricycle in reverse. Or in this case, we're looking at uh, one of the world's smallest cars on top gear. This is the PLP 50. And here's a look at what happens when uh, it gets overpowered, shall we say. Oh, oh my God. Well, there you go. Uh, and clearly there, that looks a lot like uh, an AC-75 if it had wheels and we're on, uh, on the road. But, uh, but anyway, that's what's happening uh, on board this boat. The axis of heel goes aft when uh, the boat heels and that makes the bow go up in the air. A couple other things that lead to sky jumps. Well, you could have too much lift on the main foil. And when that happens, the bow goes up. You could have not enough lift on the rudder foil. Um, and I personally think in the breeze, they're pre-setting it for the upwind leg. I don't know if that's true, but if that is the case in the pre-starts, then, uh, then uh, yeah, you, you could get off balance. And as the boat slows down, when Ben Ainsley luffed up, and if you notice in that video, I, I didn't mention it, but they went through the lee of um, Lunarosa. So they were underpowered. And then all of a sudden, as they broke through their wind shadow, the sail plan powered up, but at that point, the boat was already dropping, and then it shot up in the air. Maybe that's what's happening. Um, you could also have uh, too much heel, as you mentioned, Jack. And, of course, the heel makes the rudder cavitate when it comes up out of the water and also drops the, uh, drops the stern down. So let's take a look at the foils a bit closer. And we've been telling uh, viewers that you can write in to the Ask Jack section on cupexperience.com, Jack's website, and uh, he'll answer them for you right here. So this question, Jack, came from Gene Willos Egnor, who asked about how each team approaches their foil design. Yeah, and you know, I always say that I don't know all the answers, but I always know where to get them. And one of the places I got some parts of the answers for this were from a, a great website, uh, Mozzie Sales. Those guys are doing a great job of analyzing things. But um, the foils are just so important to this, and they are so complex, and every team has experimented and come up with different solutions. We don't know what the right solution is, but let's just take a look at some of the thought process and some of the designs that the teams have come up with. Today's question is about the foils. How do you design them and what is fast? Let's start by taking a look at the shapes. Here's a great shot from the America's Cup World Series in December. That's the T-shaped foil of Team New Zealand ahead of the Y-shaped foil on Ineos Team UK. It's great the way the camera angle lined up here so that we could see the T-shape and the Y-shape to compare them. Now, teams have also experimented with a W shape. Here's Ineos Team UK. That's something that they experimented with before as did Luna Rosa. So how do you design these things? Well, you start with the class rule. Here's the diagram that shows the dimensions that you have to fit your foil wings into. There's a blue line drawn across this diagram that shows us where the water surface would be. 
The green lines show the T-shaped foil, and the red lines, obviously, that's the Y-shaped foil. Notice that if you use a Y-shaped foil, you have less of the vertical arm that's in the water, less wetted surface. So on the green T-foil, you've got more wetted surface area, that means more drag, but there must be something that compensates for that in terms of building the design this way. Now, how do you decide what to do? Well, a little trial and error. So here's Team New Zealand, their first boat when they launch, they have one of each. Remember that we want to use these wings to generate lift. Well, here's something that generates a lot of lift, a sailplane. And we know that Team New Zealand has now zeroed in on the T-shaped foils and what we call high aspect ratio. If we compare that to Ineos Team UK, they have kind of a delta shape, which is much wider. If we look at the two boats together in this picture, you can see Team New Zealand having a very high aspect ratio. That means long and thin. And Ineos Team UK with their delta shape with the wide root cord. Another thing that we have to deal with is this idea of what happens out at the end of the foil wing, and almost all of the teams have these tips on it. What are those for? Well, everybody who's ever looked out the window of an airplane and seen this on the end of the wing, you're seeing the exact same thing. And what that's designed to do is to get rid of the vortices that are created from the high pressure air underneath the wing that's trying to escape. You want it to escape off the trailing edge. You don't want it to escape off of the wing tips. Now, that bulb can contain the control mechanisms for the wing flaps. So that's one way to do it. Here's another way. This was something that Ineos Team UK experimented with. See those gray things that the arrows are pointing to? We think those are actually actuators to control the flaps because this was their W-shaped foil. Very, very complex mechanism to be able to control the flaps on both sections of the arms in the W. There's another problem that, that they had with this and you can see it in this picture. This is their W-shaped wing. And look at that water that's flowing out at a couple of different places. That water is flowing out of cavities that were in this wing that they had there to try to control it. So the answer is, here's what Team New Zealand has done with their, with the winglets, very small winglets at the end. And with that bulb protruding forward, we know that Ineos has gone to a Y shape with winglets. This is their latest version of their foils. And Luna Rosa as well is with a Y shape with small winglets. Which one is going to be the right solution? Well, we're going to find out pretty soon. So thanks very much for the question on the foils. And I want to thank our questioner, Gene willows Agner. Gene is a curator at the Mariner's Museum in Newport News, Virginia where they have on permanent display the AC-72 that won in San Francisco. Here it is on display. It's a permanent display there. And Gene is the person who mostly put this thing together. When it arrived at Newport News from Oracle, you had six pieces, two hulls, two cross beams, the pod and the bowsprit, and buckets and buckets of titanium fasteners. Jean is the person who figured the puzzle out, put it together. She's small enough that she would actually crawl in through the cross beam arms to attach a lot of the fasteners to put the thing together. A fabulous thing. Jean, thanks so much for your question. Looking forward for more Ask Jacks. This is fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you, Jack. That was one of your best ones. And thank you, Gene. Great question. The key to this Modern America's Cup, of course, is foiling and maintaining control of the boat on the foils. That's the hard part. You know, you've got to be kind of a different breed of sailor in the Modern America's Cup, somewhat of an adrenaline junkie. Uh, and a foil expert, of course, and Jimmy Spithill certainly is that. Here's a look at him cross-training on a foil board. Mate, who doesn't love foiling? That's, that's my question. I mean, you, you go and speak to any kid nowadays, and if you put on the beach like a foil board or a normal surfboard, he's going straight to the foil board. He's picking it up. Me too. The beauty of being able to just pick up your foil board and just pump it up and then off you go by yourself and your foiling is just so pure and simple. That, that's the great thing about the sports. You can have both ends of the spectrum, yet they both apply. And you, you learn something from either that you can apply to the other. For us, it's always good just to try things outside of our comfort zone and outside of our normal world because uh, you can, you can 
generally take a, a lesson um, that you can apply back at work. Did a bit of training for, you know, the sort of breath hold and the free dive training. Man, that's tough. That's hard work. But again, it just pushes you. It's getting comfortable in an uncomfortable setting. And what you learn is not to panic, just trying to calm down. Now, I think that's something every athlete, you try to train yourself to do, that when the heat comes on, the pressure comes on, or you're getting exhausted, that you try and sort of calm yourself down to make a good decision, because that's usually one of the key points or key drivers to a good decision is to calm down, take it all in and then make a decision. Not being a sort of rushed, stressed, panic mode making the decision because more often than not, just like in life, you'll probably make the wrong one. It's just such a cool time to be involved in the game. I mean, it's another skill you've got to learn. You go at surfing, you can go foiling, you can go uh, wing foiling, you know, kite foiling, windsurfers now. I mean, there are things from foil surfing that'll fly here. Any time you go foiling, you get a sensation of, of the G-forces. And the bigger the boat, generally the more, the more that can happen just because of the speeds. And these boats you can really throw around like a dinghy, yet the speeds and the loads are of a huge boat. When you're out there and you're going at full throttle, yeah, they're unbelievable. From a technology point of view, from the foiling point of view, it's man hit. It's incredible to think what will be the next step now. And when you look back at probably the last decade in this game, man, what a decade to be involved in the America's Cup. I mean, it's just been this huge quantum leap from what we call somewhat standard sailing to now really being on the cutting edge. It's all good and well to come out and, and talk the talk on the land, but at the end of the day, they're not going to hand you the trophy for that. They're going to hand you the trophy for going out and winning on the water. So you've got to go with the moment and, and you've got to leave it all out in the field. Like any great sporting team or great sporting battle, you know, that's, that's what you live for. And the boats are super physical and the design is so new. It's, yeah, it really has got the makings of the San Francisco campaign and I think that's a, a pretty cool thing. It's a different time, that's for sure. You know, it's one thing to design fast foils. It's another thing to know how to harness their potential. And, of course, Jimmy does that really well. And, uh, you know, this America's Cup has kind of evolved into a much different skill set, one that Ben Ainsley might not necessarily be as, as in tune to. With all due respect to his sailing, Jimmy's a man who certainly knows a thing or two about getting a lot out of foils. And Kecko Bruni does, of course, as well. And, I mean, by comparison, <laughs> could you imagine Dennis Connor? On, uh, on foils these days. With all due respect to Dennis, I think even he'd agree it is a much different America's Cup. So the big question is, can Ben Ainsley and Ineos Team UK come back, Jack? In our last show, we talked about Ben's sort of roller coaster career, and in a funny way, that might be the key because he has come back from many different performances or, or low points before. Look at the Olympics. Look at the comeback in the 34th America's Cup in San Francisco when he was on board. Um, of course, in the America's Cup World Series in the 35th Cup leading up to Bermuda, he had some up and down performances before winning. And then uh, the America's Cup World Series in this event where he finished dead last, couldn't win a race, and then came back in the round robins to turn it all around and was undefeated. So if anyone can come back, Jack, it's probably Ben. So the big question is, can he do it in time to beat the Italians? You know, he needs a bit of a break with the wind. So he needs... Let's, Sunday is supposed to be lighter than, uh, than the Saturday racing. Ben doesn't need that. He needs a break with the wind. He also needs to just, you know, don't try to do anything too dramatic in the start. He may be feeling the pressure of having a boat that's a click slower, um, but it's only a click. So get a decent start. Give yourself a chance to control the race. And, you know, the mental toughness will kick in. And we're going to see some great racing, no matter who finishes in front. You know, another thing to keep in mind, as you say, if they can get a good start, get off the line at least even, there's the Giles Scott factor. His tactics have been, uh, he's been the MVP of this uh, product cup so far for Ineos Team UK. And if you can get him back into a role where he's picking shifts against the Italians, they've got a strong shot. Start even, uh, don't come off the foils, tack well and then get Giles Scott into the game that he knows how to play. Let's take a look at what the viewers think, and thanks to all of our viewers for commenting. It's clear here that um, a lot of people are still voting and rooting for Ineos Team UK. 
to make a comeback. We also put a poll out on Facebook to see who people think will win, regardless of who they want to win. This tells a slightly different story, Jack. Uh, and not surprisingly, it is in favor of Lunarosa Prada Pirelli, 59 to 41. And of course, they've been undefeated uh, in, the, uh, in this event so far in the finals. On schedule tonight, two more races, of course. Tomorrow, we're going to have two more as well. And as Jack said, they only need to win three more, the Italians, in order to get to seven. Or can Ben Ainsley come back and, uh, and pull off an upset? Clearly, that's what he's hoping for. Jack, what are the weather conditions for tonight's races? Yeah, so tonight we're, we're looking at uh, 9 to 12 knots from the southwest. Um, that's foiling conditions for the Ineos boat. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. Okay, and how about the race course? Uh, remember that they said no, we're not going to use courses B or C because of the trying to keep the crowds down. They're still under COVID too. So they'll be either out on course A or on uh, D or E down in the paddock off of Wahiki Island. Okay, and you can watch it all, of course, if you're in the United States on NBC Sportsnet, or you can download or, or um, sign up for NBC Sports Gold online to follow the action. And remember, uh, send in your questions to Ask Jack at CupExperience.com. We want to hear from you guys, and uh, we'll put you in the show. We want to put you in the show. So ask Jack a question. We'll try to answer it. Thanks to all the sponsors who support our show, and thanks to you guys for watching. That's it for us. This third day of the Product Cup Finals continues tonight, and we're excited to see it. I'm sure you are, too, and I know the British fans are excited to see it come back, and the Italian fans, of course, are quite happy so far with the performance. Uh, we want to remind you to join us for the Cup Experience each night, by 8 p.m. on every scheduled race day now through the end of the 36 America's Cup. Join us, and we hope you tell your friends to join us as well. To uh, send us comments or join our mailing list, you can send an email to TuckerTLive at gmail.com, and you can also send us photos of you guys enjoying Mount Gay Rum or uh, Polini Coffee, and we'll put you in the show. You can subscribe to our Facebook or YouTube channels. Uh, Twitter is Tucker T Live, and of course, Tucker Thompson One on Instagram. And finally, visit Jack's website, cupexperience.com. Sign up for his newsletter and also um, the Ask Jack questions. You can click on it and send your questions in. So, Jack, this brings us to our, uh, our traditional toast at the end. Uh, here's to you for staying up so late. I've got a Mount Gay uh, rum, and I know you've got some coffee, right? I mean, I've got my Italian coffee. I'm going to have to expect that we're going to see a couple more Italian wins. Although, let's see what Ben Ainsley can do today. Well, Cheers. One way or another, it's going to be exciting. Cheers, Jack. Thanks very much. And that wraps up another show. Thank you guys very much for joining us. We certainly hope you enjoyed it. For Jack Griffin, awake late at night in Switzerland, and our producer-director, Mason Sheen, I'm Tucker Thompson here in the United States. Cup racing begins shortly. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you once again at the Cup Experience tomorrow.